Good evening. I want to welcome our visitors, Frank and Rita, and Camilla and Hal Jr., and thank Hal for the good prayer. I like his colorful way when he prays. It's very clear and very understandable. Not that we're immodest or anything, but we're going to talk about modesty this evening. Modesty is a result of sin, and it's a type of correction for the sin committed. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Genesis 3 verse 11. You see, in the beginning man was sinless. He had no need for modesty. None whatsoever. But James tells us how sin begins. Not in Adam's case, but in general. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. That's James 1 verse 15. It all begins in the mind, does it not? You have a thought, a desire, you act upon that desire, and then it becomes sin, which leads to death. You know, the New Testament teaches us about modesty. Further, the New Testament is the authority. And this authority has not diminished with the passing of the centuries. What the New Testament says regarding modesty is binding upon Christians today, just as it always has been. It never changes. What the New Testament teaches about modesty is truth, which if violated, constitutes sin. When we look for a definition of modesty, the English word modesty only appears once in the King James Version in 1 Timothy 2 verse 9. Modesty is from the Greek word kosmios. Kosmios. It means orderly, well-arranged, decency, modest, in harmonious agreement and adornment. Cosmos appears in the Septuagint in Ecclesiastes 12 verse 9, and it is translated to set in order. And it was applied to Solomon's proverb. We also know that cosmios is derived from cosmos, which is the world, right? Cosmos. Which means order, regular disposition, ornament, decoration, embellishment, adornment. In 1 Peter 3, verse 3, it's used among many other ways of the world in which we live. We find it also in Matthew 13, 35 and Mark 16, 15. Modesty can apply to one's manner of dress. The context for that is 1 Timothy 2, verses 9 and 10, and it affects gaudy dress. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. 1 Timothy 2, verses 9 and 10. Also, the word for apparel is from the Greek word katastol, which means letting down. As used in the Septuagint in Isaiah 63, verse 3, it means garment, for a Hebrew meaning a covering or a wrap. That's the meaning of that word. Modesty is also biblically applied to one's demeanor or his behavior. You can be immodest with your actions in life and with your words. Cosmos appears in the qualification of elders as good behavior. 
1 Timothy 3, verse 10. The Apostle Peter taught modesty and addressed both what one may wear and internal modesty. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 5. The Greek for adorning in verse 3 is, once again, cosmos. The Greek word. The summary definition of modesty involved both one's manner of dress and his inward qualities. You know, the well-ordering of, is not of dress and behavior only, but also of one's inner life, which exhibits itself outwardly. You know, you are what you act like you are, most generally. And people will know and be able to see. Biblical modesty is something that starts on the inside, and then it works its way out to the outside of the person. Just like unbiblical modesty, it starts on the inside and works its way out. Just like sin is a thought and then it is an action. The same way here with modesty. Modesty in context, we have a brief exposition of modesty uh, three slides back when we talked about 1 Timothy 2 verses 9 and 10. The context of that, 1 Timothy 2, verses 8 through 11, relates first to public worship. Especially in the public worship, women are cautioned to be careful lest their outward adornment pose a distraction both to themselves and to other people. Shamefacedness is the natural internal moral quality of blushing when sin is viewed as repulsive. Sobriety is soundness and soberness of the mind resulting in self-restraint. So modesty is extremely important. Isaiah says in Isaiah 16 verse 23, that women with braided hair and strands of gold or silver which glistened in the sunlight and layered themselves with jewels. That's what this knot with braided hair and gold pearls or costly array meant. It refers to a gaudy show in which women braid their hairs and do this. Isaiah was well aware of that. He had seen it before. But which, cometh, which becometh a woman professing godliness with good works. This is contrasted with the mere outward display. The inner display is more precious before God and more representative of the Christian womanhood that we should be exhibiting to the world. The prohibition is on the extreme or otherwise it addresses the propriety of adornment, extolling the praise or inward over the outward adornment. What you think in your heart is what you are. And then when you demonstrate it by your dress, people know who you are based upon these verses that we're reading. Let's take a brief exposition of 1 Peter 3 verses 1 through 5. From the first verse of this context, one's behavior rather than anything else such as physical adornment is commanded. Verse 1 and 2 champion chaste and holy behavior as a means for a Christian wife to influence a husband whose wife's words are ineffective towards him. The Christian woman does not rely on lavish outward adornment to secure and keep the attractions of a man. The reference to adorning here is the same as those in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. Comparatively speaking, the inward adornment is more precious to God and more effective for Christians than outward physical adornment. Adorning. The Apostle Peter teaches a disposition that was practiced by godly women, such as Sarah, in 1 Peter 3, verses 5 and 6. And that's what the Lord is looking for, that type of 
adornment inwardly. Peter did not prohibit the wearing of jewelry or cosmetics or clothes. He did not prohibit extreme adornment or adornment that which is overshadowed or displaces a holy reverential behavior. Sometimes what you wear on the outside covers up who you are. And Christianity cannot show through by the manner in which you're dressed when you're in public. Peter and Paul urge holiness to be that which is exhibited and not hindered outwardly. So the way you dress is how people look at you. Are they seeing a Christian individual? Or are they seeing somebody who looks like maybe a harlot by the way that they have dressed? Is modesty a variable? You know, some say that it is situational. It depends on where you are and what you're doing. There is a sense in which modesty is not variable. God's word does not change. Therefore, it is not variable, is it? There are no special circumstances, either then or now, that can mitigate or set aside this teaching about God's word. You can't change it. It's set in stone. It will never be right for one's dress or degree of undress to overshadow or displace a Christian's holy behavior. Holy behavior is much more important than how you dress and what you look like. God is concerned about Christian modesty of both men and women in and out of the worship assembly. Men and women should be modestly attired inwardly and outwardly and always, especially in public. Because the public judges you by how you look and by what you do. And whether or not they think that your attitude and example demonstrate what you believe. There is a sense in which modesty is variable. Modesty in public worship is equivalent to what constitutes modesty in any public setting. What you do here, you can do on the outside. However, what is biblically modest in public differs from what is biblically modest in the private setting of a married couple's bedroom. You can't do that in public or in worship. The bedroom is a different situation. The modern day problem over modesty is not primarily the putting on of apparel, but the taking off of apparel and clothes today. People want to get closer to the bedroom in public than they ever should even think about or consider doing. People, and unfortunately Christians too, have taken modesty confined to private settings and moved it to public display. Frequently you see women running around with their underwear on the outside of their clothes, particularly in fashion magazines and things like that. That is being immodest. It is sinful and it discounts biblical modesty. It numbs the sense of morality. There is no shamefacedness. There is no embarrassment for these people who do this. It displaces holy behavior and influence as well as it promotes lust. And that's their intent for doing it, promoting lust. <clears throat> the topic of modesty is also affected by the topic of lust. The attire of a harlot has always aroused the baser nat nature of men. Men are very basic and they're easily aroused. The attire of a harlot is discernible and it has a calculated result. 
When they dress that way, they know exactly what they want. Proverbs 7, verse 10. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She knew exactly what she was looking for. Proverbs 7, verse 10. It is, is it reasonable to suppose that the dress or the lack thereof which is worn by a harlot encouraging men to lust, will it lead to less lust if worn by a Christian woman? Surely not. No Christian should try to pattern themselves after a harlot in their dress. Watching a woman bathe has been known to arouse unlawful lust in men. King David saw it in Bathsheba. She was washing and he lusted after her and he committed adultery with her. And he fathered a child with her and he murdered her husband and brought much misery upon himself and upon the nation. 2 Samuel 11 verses 2 through 5. It is advisable for women, especially those that are professing godliness, to bathe in the presence of men. No, it's not advisable. Whether it be sunbathing or swimming in public or some type of public exposure, it is not advisable for women to do that. Lust. Lust is a sin which especially men are cautioned in Scripture to avoid. Is it any more praiseworthy for women to dress provocative, provocatively to excite this lust in men? Surely not. Lust is viewed by our Lord as adultery only not yet enacted. Matthew 5 verse 28. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He has conceived of the idea, but it is not yet sin because he has not acted upon it. Matthew 5 verse 28. Lust is a sin for which the soul will be lost according to Titus and Romans and James and 1 Peter. An unambiguous and concise application of biblical modesty by the Christian is very important. It is improper for sinful and sinful for Christians to dress immodestly during worship assembly. The greater context of 1 Timothy 2 verses 9 and 10 addresses public worship. You know, mini skirts and backless dresses and high slit skirts and low cut dresses have no place in public worship. You find it in many, many places where women are exposing things that should not be exposed. The Lord considers the thigh nakedness. Especially women should be careful to wear appropriate undergarments that contribute to modesty. Sometimes their dresses are so thin that you can see what's underneath, even without the light being in the right direction. It is improper and sinful for Christians to dress immodestly in any public setting, which includes worship service. Public immodesty displaces positive Christian influence. It promotes lust and it is therefore sinful. Added to that, that former list, you should include short shorts, halter tops, tube tops, sheer blouses, contemporary swimsuits, tank tops, and other revealing provocative clothing that should not be worn by a Christian in public. The beach or swimming pool does not lessen the need for Christians to dress modestly. Modesty is not situational. 
while everybody on the beach dresses this way, it's still immodest. Does not make any difference what the situation is. At home, the modesty of one's dress varies. What may be biblically modest in the inner chambers of one's home is biblically immodest in public areas of the house while entertaining guests or while out in the yard. What you do in the home should be in the home, not in the yard. Further, what may be modest behavior between a husband and wife can be immodest in front of the children. What may be modest family dress is immodest when exhi exhibited to other people. Your night clothes are your night clothes. They're not for the public use and public seeing, even in your home. They need to be restricted to your husband and your wife and your home life. Persistence in immodesty has serious ramifications. Immodesty in the face of biblical instructions demonstrates a willful lack of subjection to God. Also to one's father or one's husband. Or in the case of a male, to his wife or his mother. Immodesty is not a usual and orderly arrangement of clothes. When you're properly dressed, then you have a usual and orderly arrangement. And then you're modest, but immodesty is not. Immodesty overshadows and displaces shamefacedness and sobriety, professing godliness and good works. It overshadows these things. Immodesty makes it impossible to influence another individual with the gospel without a word. You know, the Bible tells women that they should be able to influence their husbands without a word by the things in which they do if they have an unbelieving husband. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 5. Immodesty is sinful. It leads to additional sins and to the corruptions of others, as we saw with David in his immodest acts, even to the point of murder in the death of that child. The topic of modesty is taught in the New Testament and it is binding on us today. Each and every day we need to consider modesty. Modesty is an orderly arrangement of clothes that does not hinder the inner or spiritual side of mankind. Immodesty leads to lust and many, many other sins. Faithful and knowledgeable Christians do not wear revealing clothing in public, period. Persistent immodesty is evident of a rebellion towards God. His word, the church, the fathers, and the husbands. Just total rebellion. Immodesty ruins the Christian influence and it impairs the effectiveness of the gospel. You know, God calls on mankind to conform to His Word rather than conforming to the world. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. The initial conformity to God's Word and the plan of salvation results in gospel obedience and forgiveness of sins. Acts 2.38 Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. Faithful children of God will continue to obey the gospel. All of it, not just the modesty portion of it, but all of the word of God on a daily basis so that we may have that eternal life with him. Sometimes we do err. We need to beg for repentance. Ask God for repentance and pray to him for it. As Christians... If we're not Christians, we need to be baptized for the remission of our sins after we repent of those sins and confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We want to offer the invitation to you while we stand and sing.
Washed in the blood of the Lamb.